you have your Bible, let's look together in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5, the fifth chapter of Hebrews. There's four books of the New Testament where most of the false teaching comes from. One's Matthew, Acts, Revelation, and Hebrews. The particular paragraph that we're going to look at this morning, the reason a lot of people uh, misinterpret this text is because they think that you can be saved and then lost. You can forfeit and lose your salvation. I'm thankful that you can't. I have two questions for people who believe that you can lose your salvation. How good do you have to be to keep it? How bad do you have to be to lose it? Because we all sin and come short of the glory of God. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 11. Now, if we're studying the whole paragraph, it begins at 511, ends at 612. You're going to find a word that's used in verse 11 that's used in verse 12 of chapter 6. Of whom we have many things to say. And hard to be uttered. Seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers. Ye have need that one teach you again. Which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk. And not of strong meat. For everyone that useth. Milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is obeyed. But strong meat belongeth to them who are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Verse 9 of chapter 6. But beloved, We are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. For thus we speak. I want to preach this morning on this subject. Examining our immaturity. This morning it's pertinent and relevant that every one of us get a right understanding from God's point of view of whether we're maturing in the faith or whether we're immature in the faith. I heard about uh, a man who was asked the question, said, how's your son doing at the college he's attending? He said, well, he said, he's doing all right. He said, well, what, what's he going to study to be? He said, well, he's studying, but he's going to be an old man. He said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, well, he's making a career out of being a professional student. He said he is not progressing very much. In fact, he's dying by degree. You know, it reminds me of a lot of people in church where growing older but we're not growing up. We seem to think that once you get saved and you're going to heaven, that's really everything there is to the Christian life. But the Bible says in Philippians 1, 6, he that begun a good work in you wants to continue that work till the day of Jesus Christ. So we all, all, all of us ought to be maturing. You'll find that in this text there is a relationship to your maturity concerning how you are in the Word. In fact, in chapter 2, he said they had drifted from the Word. In chapters 3 and 4, he says they had doubted God's Word. And now you find here in this text, they are dull toward the Word. And I'm not saying that you have a relationship with the Lord 
uh, only through the word. But if you are going to get to know him and to love him and to mature, you must be a person of the Bible. You must be a person of the book. Spurgeon said, you'll always find immature people with dusty Bibles and filthy rags. All of us have the tendency to backslide. Would you agree? In fact, we are all constantly backsliding but for the grace of God. So as we look at this text this morning, there's three things I'd like for you to see. First of all, the writer gives us the spiritual condition of these particular believers. What is the spiritual condition that he diagnosed? It's like going to the doctor. And the doctor would evaluate your test and maybe you're having a checkup and he has come to some conclusions after you've been on the scales, after he's taken your blood pressure. He's come to some conclusions if he's taken an EKG. Whatever the test that you've had, maybe a CT scan, he's evaluated you and he wants you to know what your condition is. There are several things about their condition, three things. First of all, would you notice with me in this text what I call their appalling contradiction. What do you mean appalling contradiction? In the text it says they should have been eating meat and they're still on milk. And the appalling contradiction is they had not experienced normal, natural growth spiritually. Just like a baby is born and you hold that baby and you cuddle that little child and the grandparents, they hold the baby and then all of a sudden you expect that baby 10 years later just to be that baby that you can hold and cuddle. Judy and I, we have five children and uh, my youngest is our baby and, and I can't imagine him getting older. But it happens, and it's natural that we would all be of that vein. And so it's a seemingly contradiction. Growth should be normal. Not only is there what I would call an appalling contradiction, but secondly, there is an apparent digression. Now, once you look at the text, it says in verse number 11 that they are dull of hearing. Actually in the Greek it reads this way, they have become dull of hearing. In other words, there was a time they were not dull of hearing. It was a time they could hear real well. But something's happened to their spiritual ears. And all of us should realize this, you're never ever in neutral as a Christian. You're either regressing or progressing. You're either developing or you're digressing. You're never, ever in neutral. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards. You're not on a treadmill. All of us should realize this to be true. Spurgeon said it's hard to go forward, but it's worse going backwards. There's a lot of people in Scripture who went backwards, a lot. Even Abraham decided under a trial that he would journey down to Egypt and lie. David took his eyes off the Lord. Peter was not a man who could keep his promises. All of us have a tendency because of our Adamic nature and this worldly appeal for us to digress. There is not only digression, there's not only a contradiction, but thirdly the whole problem is their interpretation of the Bible. Now I want you to look at that word of whom in verse number 11. Of whom? Now what's the discussion? Is that about the Lord? No, go back to verse 10. Who's he been discussing? Well, you go back to verse 7 and verse 10. He's discussing Melchizedek. 
And he says, you know, I'm teaching you some doctrine here about Melchizedek, but this is hard to be understood. And he said, because you're dull of hearing, you can't take my preaching. And if I taught you this about Melchizedek, you would have a hard time grasping these truths because it's important that you know something about this man. You say, well, who was Melchizedek? Well, we find him in Genesis 14. And he is the person that Abraham, after delivering Lot, because Lot had gotten in trouble, Abraham gave tithes to this man. He was the king of Salem, which means he was the ruler of Jerusalem, the king of Salem. He was also a priest. Why is it important that we know about his priesthood? Because Jesus came from the tribe of Judah and you can only be a priest from the tribe of Levi. And if Jesus was going to be a priest because he's prophet, priest, and king, then Jesus must come from Melchizedek in that order. And so therefore it's important, imperative that we know these truths about who Melchizedek is because Psalm 110 tells us that Melchizedek was a real person and he is prophetically presented in Psalm 110, historically presented in Genesis 14 and it's important that we understand him doctrinally in the book of Hebrews. And he waits to chapter 7 to get to the details of who this man really is and explain it because they couldn't understand it. Now I can't tell you I'm sure uh, Joe's out here this morning. I'm sure Joe's had people to come up to him many times when he preached and say, you know, I just can't understand your preaching. And most of the time, people will say, well, that's really a slam on the preacher. Well, no, you need to clean your ears out. You, you got something in your ears. You, you just really have an ear problem and you have a difficulty understanding because most of the time, Instead of being an adult, we're still in the playpen of being a baby. And we really don't have the spiritual maturity to understand that we are not as far along as we think we are. And no matter how mature you are here this morning, you need to take serious what I'm about to say because I want to go to my second point. Not only there is the spiritual condition diagnosed by the writer, there's the severe consequences declared by the writer. There's four consequences of you not being rightly full of God and maturing as a believer and these severe Serious consequences are related of how you receive, share, digest, and use the Word of God. The first one is this. There's a serious consequence of you not receiving God's Word. Look with me at verse 11. He says you are dull of hearing. Now that Greek word dull, it seems to mean slow, sluggish. Let me give you a country translation. You're just lazy. In other words, when you come to the word in your devotional life, when you come to preaching, you get far more excited about music than you do the preaching. You get far more excited about what you feel rather than what you think. And thinking is not a real important part of your life. You're sluggish. You, you, you don't want to be stretched. In other words, what you want to do is you want to hear what you already know. So you can feel pretty good about who you are and you can be built up, you know, you can be encouraged. In fact, what's wrong is you don't receive the Word of God. In fact, you're unable to listen and to receive 
and to act on God's word. Weast even translates this word, dullness, numb. In other words, it comes from a word like the limbs of a sick lion. In other words, you're not a person who's enlightened by the word on a regular basis. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 is important for every believer. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which we preached, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in those who believe. In other words, you receive the word not as the preacher's opinion, but if he exegetes the truth and explains and applies the truth, you receive it. Warren Wiersbe says, these people were unable to listen, receive, and to act on God's word would you consider your person yourself a person who has a keen antenna in frequency with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures or is there something more important to you than the word I want you to listen to these words by Thomas Guthrie Guthrie if you find yourself loving any pleasure more than prayer, any book better than the Bible, any house more important to you than the house of God, any person better than Christ, then be alarmed because you should be a person who receives the word. The second thing in the text is they were unable to receive the word, but they're unable to share the word. Look at verse number 12. Now you read that, you think, well, wait a minute, they should have been Sunday school teachers, but now they need to be taught by somebody else, the elementary things. Read it with me. Look what it says in verse 12. For when for, for, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles, that means the beginning, the oracles, that's a word for logos, the basic teachings. Logos of God, you have become such. In other words, these people couldn't share the word. Now, some of you are going to read that and you think they should be a technical teacher in the fellowship. That's not what he's saying at all. That's a spiritual gift that God gives. But what he's really teaching here is this, that when they first got saved, they learned the ABCs, but now they can't say the alphabet. Sort of like in high school, I took French. Some of you took Spanish. Anybody take a foreign language in high school besides me? I don't know a word of it. I mean not one word of it. If I went to French, I couldn't say one word in French. Oh, cool of France. I mean, I, I'm just telling you, I can't say it. I don't know any of it. You say, well, why didn't you apply yourself? Well, I got a good grade. I got through the class, but I've not used it. So therefore, if you don't use it, you're unable to share it. I'll tell you why most of us don't witness. We can't share what we don't really know doctrinally. What does it mean that these should have been teachers? It means they should have had the ability to share spiritual truth with others because that's a mark of maturity. You say, preacher, I, I don't know enough about the Bible to share it. Well, the Bible says you ought to. Write down this verse, 1 Peter 3.15. It says that you ought to be able at any moment to take the witness stand and be cross-examined concerning the things you believe and give validity and verity concerning Bible doctrine, and you should be able to stand without any regret and be an apologetic, a person who's able to declare 
and defend the Word of God. Signs of immaturity are people who are unable to receive the Word. They're unable to share the Word. Thirdly, they're unable to digest the Word. It says they should have been eating meat because they got teeth, but they're still just drinking milk, which is pre-digested food. Now, I want to clarify something for you. I'm going to talk to you about what is the meat, what is the milk. I want to say this before I say what I'm fixing to say because I know what I'm fixing to say and you're going to think I said something I didn't say unless I say this. I rejoice in the milk. Now what is the milk? The milk is what Jesus did for you on earth. What is the meat? The meat is what Jesus is now doing in heaven for you and right now in sanctification in and through you. Now most of us are excited about the milk and that's all we can take. That's why we really get excited and we do when we hear the truth that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But boy, I'll tell you what, we don't get very excited when we find out that we died And unless we die daily and take up our cross, then we don't understand the cross at all. They're not able to digest. Why don't we move into the meat? Why is it we have to be spoon fed? I had a man walk up to me in a meeting And this happens all the time, and two things are true about me. Number one, I don't ever let anybody talk about their pastor to me when I'm in a meeting. And if anybody wants to meet with me, they don't meet with me unless the pastor approves of it, and I want him to be present if there's anything of criticism. So a boy walked up to me, and he said, you know, church boss, you find them in every church. Sometimes it's a woman, but this was a man. And... uh, he walks up to me and he says, I'm thinking about leaving our church. I said, well, what's, you, what's wrong with you? He said, I'm not getting fed. I, I'm just not getting fed. I said, how long have you been saved? He said, 30 years. I said, boy, isn't that a testimony? You're 30 years old and the Lord, you can't feed yourself. <laughs> well, I, you're really doing good. I, that killed my offer and I owed him $50 when I left. But I, I, I just tell you, it, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. People that say and admit they can't digest the Word. I challenge you to read John 14, 26. John 15, 26. John 16, 13 through 16. And find out that Jesus said when the Holy Spirit has come, he'll take the things of my word and he'll unveil them to you and teach you my truth. A person who is immature is a person who's not allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work of the master teacher and to cause them to be able to simulate and appropriate truth and apply it to their life. The third, the third, fourth thing about these people, and I need to move on, is not only they couldn't receive the word, They were unable to share the word. They were unable to digest the word, but they're unable to use the word. Look with me at verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful. Now that's the only time that Greek word unskillful is used in the New Testament. It's not used anywhere else. It actually is a word that you could translate this way, without experience. The NIV translates it not acquainted. The NAS translates it, the New American Standard, not accustomed. It's actually a word which means this. F.F. Bruce has the best definition. It's unable to pass judgment on moral situations as they confront us. Notice they have no experience in the word of righteousness. Now whether you know it or not, the Bible is intended for you to apply in your daily life. 
I'll say that again. Whether you know it or not, the Bible is intended for you to hide the word in your heart, to apply its principles, to be taught all things, to observe those. And the Bible is a book of principles, precepts, and promises, and you are to apply the Bible to your everyday living by the Spirit as you yield to God, and you're to be a person who is skillful in the Word and not unskillful. It's the Word of righteousness, which takes us to the thought of imputed righteousness and justification, imparted righteousness and sanctification, which says that you are to practice righteousness. 1 John 2, 29 you're to practice righteousness. 1 John 3, 7, you're to practice righteousness. He that is born of God habitually, continually practices righteousness. You're a person who knows how to use the word of God. Let me move to my last point because I want to finish on a positive note. Some people say, well, preaching ought to not be so negative. Well, talk to God about it. Preaching ought to have a reproving, rebuking element. And it ought to have an exhorting, teaching element. And so I want to talk to you lastly, not only the serious consequences, and some of you are traveling that highway. I mean, you don't have a quiet time. Where it used to be people were faithful to church and they were there about every Sunday. Now the average church member misses more than one third of the Sundays. It used to be church was very important to people. My last point is this. I want to talk to you about the Scriptural constitution that ought to be detected in every believer. There's three of them. It's found in verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them who are of full age. So let's evaluate whether you're mature or immature. These are marks of maturity that I'm going to mention. First of all, you're a person of biblical theology. Now that's made fun of today. In fact, if a person is a person of Bible doctrine and they study Bible doctrine, we think, well, that's left for the preacher, that's left for the staff, no, you are to be a theologian. You are to be a doctrinal student. You say, well, preacher, we all believe in Jesus. Well, what Jesus do you believe in? In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says this to the Judaizers who were guilty of false teaching and had deceived many of the people at Corinth. He said they preach a Holy Spirit that's not the Holy Spirit I preach. He said they preach a Jesus that's not the Jesus I preach. What Jesus are you talking about? Are you talking about the Jesus who is God but yet he became man and lived as a man, not as God. He's 100% man and he's 100% God. Are you talking about the Little Jesus that had bad days. Do you know what you believe? Do you know strong meat? Do you know that Christ is your life? Do you realize that you can't live the Christian life and Christ is your life? Do you doctrinally understand what it means daily to report to the cross DOA and to reckon yourself dead so that Christ can live his life through you? Have you come to the point in the Christian life that doctrinally you are stable and not tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Doctrine is important. It's 
Secondly, not only biblical theology, but biblical thinking. Look at verse 14 again. Even those who by reason of use have their senses. Now what do we mean have their senses? Exercise to know what? Good and evil. Now let me tell you what we mean by our senses. Now we have eyes, we have ears, but according to scripture, Ephesians 1, 17 and 18, we have eyes in our inner man. According to Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So I have spiritual ears on the inside. I have spiritual eyes on the inside in my spirit. I have also have senses because the Bible says in Psalm 34 verse 8, check me out. It says, I've tasted the Lord. So I'm able to taste the Lord. I'm able to see the Lord. I'm able to hear the Lord. If my senses have been exercised, in other words, am I living soulishly out of my personality or am I, uh, am I living spiritually out of my spirit? Am I a constant repenting person because it's biblical thinking? What does repentance mean? What does repentance mean? It means to change the way you think so you can change the way you live. But if we're not careful, our churches are designed with 45 minutes of entertainment whereby we really don't have time very much for the word to be expounded and explained and we for sure don't want to be moved off center and we sure don't want to hear something that we don't already know. Because we've got too many babies that are playing and not enough people who are adults who are maturing. Biblical thinking. Biblical theology. My last point. Here it is. Biblical truth. You're to know right from wrong. You're saying, oh, preacher, wait a minute. The Bible's not clear. The Bible's gray about a lot of areas. Oh, you just think it is. See, when I first got saved, let me explain something to you. When I first got saved, I got saved on a Saturday night. Believe it or not, I went in church when I got saved. I went to church that night, but I got saved when I got home that night. And God saved me. The next Friday night, we usually got together with this other couple, Judy and I. We'd just been married. And we would get together and we would uh, play rook. And I would drink a beer and he would drink some beer. And I had a little stronger drink there at the place where I lived. And so that night, that next Friday night, I got my beer. Now I hadn't heard a sermon on beer. I hadn't read anything in the Bible about alcoholic beverage. So I got my beer. I thought I could still drink a beer as long as I don't get drunk, as long as it's in moderation, as long as I just don't overdo it. It'll be all right. And so I took a swallow of that beer, and the Holy Spirit of God said, you ain't drinking that no more. Now, he probably didn't say any, but he said, you're not drinking that anymore. So I got up and I went over there and I poured it out. And then I poured every other alcoholic beverage I had in my little residence out. I haven't touched any since. You say, no, preacher, wait a minute. You, you hadn't been taught the Bible yet then. Well, the Holy Spirit will teach you right and wrong. Now, as I began to study the Bible, which now you have these young preachers who say, the Bible doesn't teach total abstinence. Well, they just hadn't read it. They just haven't read it. What I'm trying to communicate to you is a lot of things that you would put your approval on, 
you need to study what the Bible says and you'll find out there's not near as much gray area as you think there is. You'll find out that there is right and there's wrong. There is truth and there is error. Let me give you a definition of discernment. Because there's a word used here. The word discernment is used in the plural in this particular verse, verse 14. It's used in the singular in Philippians 1.9. Let me quote Philippians 1.9 for you. It says, may your love, agape, abound, overflow more and more in all knowledge. How do you get knowledge? From the word of God. And judgment, the King James says, but the best translation is discernment. Now, what is discernment? If discernment's used here in verse 14 and discernment's used in Philippians 1.9, it's singular in Philippians 1.9. It's plural here in verse 14. What's he speaking of? He's speaking of this. Here's my definition of discernment. It's to understand. It's the spiritual discipline of understanding and applying God's word with the intention or the purpose for you to be able to separate truth from error and right from wrong. In other words, if you're going to dress and it's revealing and bringing attention to parts of you that should not be brought attention to, then you need to read what the Bible says about that in Proverbs. So does it matter how you dress? Oh, some people say we're free in Jesus. It doesn't matter how you dress. That's legalism. No, what's legalism to you is biblical principles in the Bible. And our problem today is we just really don't want to give much thought. I want to ask you a couple of questions and I'm finished. Would you consider your person, you to be a person who not only reads the Bible, hears the Bible preached, but you've learned the art of rolling it over, rolling it over and meditating on it to the point that you have the Spirit of God who's teaching you and you apply it. In other words, when's the last time you heard a sermon here in this church and on Monday you thought, I'm going to apply what I heard here Sunday? When's the last time in your quiet time? things that you know are error. Are you stiff-arming those things? Do you rejoice in the truth? Because only the truth will set you free. Taking this checkup today. Do you find yourself not being able to receive the word, use the word, share the word and digest the word or do you find yourself to be a person who has biblical theology biblical thinking and biblical truth a discerning person person of conviction not based on tradition but on what the Bible teaches <laughs>